folks, I'm Pastor Jim Thomas from the Village Chapel here in Nashville, Tennessee. And alongside me is Professor John C. Lennox, Professor of Mathematics in the University of Oxford, Fellow in Mathematics at the Philosophy of Science, and Pastoral Advisor at Green Templeton College in Oxford. And he's the author of many books, including his widely popular God's Undertaker, Has Science Buried God? Uh, and that speaks about the interface between science, philosophy, and theology uh, as well. John has a book we're going to be talking about today, Seven Days That Divide the World. And uh, I'm very excited about that because it coincides with our beginning a study at the Village Chapel here on the book of Genesis. So uh, let me welcome John Lennox. John, you're, you're speaking to us from uh, over in England, I believe, right? I am indeed. I'm just outside Oxford in the country, in the famous Cotswold country. And oh. the temperature in Celsius is about five or six. It was minus uh, yesterday and the day before. And we've wow. had just a little snow, but that's where I am. So how does that translate for us Fahrenheit people? How does that translate? What would that be? Oh, well, the, the temperature at the moment is about, I would say, 40. 40. Okay, something, that's not something too bad. Something like that. That's not too bad. Well, I've been over there once or twice myself into uh, England and uh, so enjoyed each and every trip. And I can just imagine what a delight it is to live right near Oxford there. Uh, your history, as I recall, your, your own... Uh, story uh, takes you, you've, you've been in Oxford quite a bit, and were you a student there in university? No, I grew up in Northern Ireland, and then yes. when I was about 18, 19, I went to Cambridge, Cambridge to do mathematics. Okay. I spent seven years in Cambridge, did my PhD there, and then took up a teaching post at the University of Wales, where I was for about 27 oh. years. And then wow. I went from there to the University of Oxford, and I've been 20 odd years here. So I've been around a little bit. Yeah, that's true. And of course, you speak widely. You've, you've written many other books as well. And uh, uh, we're going to actually talk about uh, the Seven Days book in a little bit, but I also think folks would be really curious about your book, Where is God in a Coronavirus World? How has that been received, John? That's been received wonderfully well. What happened was that when we were told that this was a serious, not only epidemic, but pandemic, hmm. I thought, I, we're going to be shut in, and what am I going to be able to do? And I thought that well, perhaps I could try to write something that would help Christians particularly, but not only them, to understand the nature of the pandemic and to look at it from a biblical point of view, because it mm. raises a huge series of questions. The main one being, where is God in a coronavirus world? And that's actually the title of the book. I wrote it by working very hard for a single week. I finished it on Saturday night, and by the next wow. Wednesday, it was already in print. And oh. it's now around the world in over 30 languages. And oh. in answer to your question, I, I'm yeah. really encouraged in the response of people to it. It seems yeah. to have struck a note. I don't try to behave as if I knew all the answers, because we don't. The problem of suffering and evil is one of the hardest that any of us mm -hmm. face, whether we're Christians or not. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to try to show that Christianity is actually something very important to say mm -hmm. into a world that's suffering, where there's a huge number of desperately ill people and many, mm -hmm. many deaths. Christianity mm -hmm. does have something very important to say. And I tried to say it, and that book is available very easily on the internet. It's one of the cheapest books you'll ever buy. And for many people in the two thirds world, it was made available on the internet without any cost. Wow, that's great. Well, you also, I believe in the last year have released a book on artificial intelligence. Is that correct? Yes, I, I've written a book called 2084. Mm -hmm. artificial intelligence and the future of humanity. And of course, that takes off from George Orwell's book, 1984, which was a mm -hmm. dystopia, 
where he imagined the world of 1984. And that book has left its imprint on our language, even thought speak and big brothers watching you and all that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And mm -hmm. because many of the things that Orwell said are being realized around our world today, and people are talking about artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I thought it might be a good idea because there's a great deal of confusion and not only confusion, but actual fear. Uh, mm -hmm. People concerned about what's going to happen. That I thought yeah. I'd write a book that would take a careful look at what AI is, what its good aspects are, because there are many of those, and what its negative aspects are. Mm -hmm. And particularly to distinguish between the AI that actually works, which normally means that You've got a system that does a single thing very well that normally takes human intelligence to do. So we call it artificial intelligence. It's not real intelligence. And then all the hype, that is the futuristic ideas of uploading our brains onto silicon mm. or turning ourselves into gods as mm. Yuval Noah Harari, the best-selling Israeli author thinks. And I wanted to investigate that carefully because the Bible has a great deal that is important to say about this striving mm -hmm. to rebuild the Tower of Babel, so to speak, and reach mm. for the heavens and turn ourselves into some kind of gods by genetic engineering. Wow. So these are hugely important topics. And the book is available. There's a video series that goes with it and oh. all the rest of it. And do you address, I'm sure you do, some of the ethical concerns of the uh, the way some of the corporations, for instance, can control the flow of information or ideas or 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 the the, the kind of identity uh, stuff that might be uh, manipulated uh, from afar? And I suppose there are all kinds of, like you said, fears that people have. Yes, indeed. The, the question, say, of, well, we can easily explain this by, by thinking of visual recognition technologies. And you start with the good side. Um, for instance, x-rays. You Here's a typical AI system in medicine. You take a million photographs of people's lungs. You get the best doctors to label them with the diseases they represent. That's mm. your database. And then we take a photograph of your lungs and the AI system, which is a computer, uh, compares the photograph of your lungs with all the others and it comes up with a diagnosis. Now these mm. days that diagnosis will probably be better than the one you get at your local hospital. And you can see the value of that is colossal. Right. But just change it a bit and you move to facial recognition. Now you can see that law enforcement people are delighted to have a tool where they can pick out terrorists in a stadium or they can recognize um, criminals in a railway station and so on. Mm -hmm. But of course, the downside is that facial recognition technology can be used to intrude very seriously upon people's privacy. And that raises all kinds of ethical questions, especially when you realize that in certain parts of the world, this kind of technology is being increasingly used actually to control minority populations. And uh -huh. that is a frightening development. That mm -hmm. really is 1984, and it's come uh -huh. a long time before 2084. <sighs> so you're right. The ethics of the situation is important. And that's why I believe that I want to encourage bright, young, scientifically minded Christians to work mm -hmm. on the positive side of AI, but to think about these negatives so that they can contribute Mm -hmm. to building in strong ethical norms mm -hmm. into the systems. Because of course, we have to do that. Mm -hmm. And the norms say that are obeyed by a self-driving vehicle, they will be the ethical norms of the people programming that vehicle. And mm -hmm. where do their values come from? So right. 
that means that the discussion of values is now central to contemporary technology and yeah. some of the really big names realize it and mm. that's encouraging but I'm not too sanguine about the question of getting international agreement on this kind of ethics, although we should yeah. try to do so. Well, I was speaking with a, a friend of yours, Oz Guinness, uh, not too long ago, and he was actually on one of these Friday night chats that we do as well. Um, and we were talking about, he asked me the question, what keeps you awake at night? And I said, the lack of consensus on values, and you've just yes. hit it right square on. Um, if we don't have some consensus or some shared common values, how can we ever get to a place where we share the same ethical concerns and, and, and come to the same ethical conclusions, right? That's a very serious question because in a sense, our generation or the one before mm -hmm. is the last generation that was deeply influenced by the Judeo-Christian tradition mm -hmm ethics of the Ten Commandments. And now there's such a press towards subjectivism and relativism, mm -hmm. your truth and my truth, your values and my values, mm -hmm. that people have become completely anesthetized mm -hmm. to realizing that without a shared system of values that are independent of ourselves, and that's a crucial mm -hmm. thing, society yes. collapses. And we need to make that very clear. And mm -hmm. that is, of course, where the, the Christian biblical worldview comes into its own, because it tells us, yes, there mm -hmm. is a transcendent set of values. God made us moral beings in his own image. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if we look to him and his word, we can discover a real basis on which society can operate. So these are vital things to, to be thought that's, about. And that's the reason we can't go to sleep at night because yeah. these values are being undermined all mm. over the place, even by people that claim to be Christian, sadly. Mm. Well, that makes a great transition uh, for for what I want, really wanted to talk to you about, about the seven days that uh, divide the world book, because uh, as you say in that book, and we'll, we'll post the, uh, the, the image of the cover up on the screen here, but uh, you talk about how it's really, uh, the, the, what we think about Genesis chapter one is so critical as it relates to our worldview. Um, uh, uh, John, what are, the, what are the big worldview questions as you see it that, uh, that uh, Genesis one, uh, addresses and uh, and and gives us hope and and I'd even say joy about the book of Genesis is absolutely foundational to any understanding of the Bible, mm -hmm. and people often ask me what are the big questions that have interested me all my life, and I say there are two main ones. The first one is about the universe. Mm -hmm. Is it a creation or not? Mm. Is there a God behind this universe? Or is it just something that has apparently appeared by random unguided processes? Mm -hmm. And the second question is about the status of human life. Mm. Is it made in the image of God or not? Now, the first of those questions is answered in Genesis 1. And the second of those questions is answered both in Genesis 1 and in the chapters that succeed. Yes. And that is so absolutely crucially important. The difference between believing that the universe is an intended creation of God and that human beings are also intended by God and made in his image is very important. Many people have not quite noticed that the universe shows God's glory. I have a telescope in my garden and on the rare occasions when you can see the starry heavens, I look up and look at the galaxies. Andromeda is one of my favorites, a hundred billion oh. stars. It's hard to get your mind around it. It shows God's glory. Yeah. But the stars were not made in God's image. Only human beings were. And wow. so, Jim, to get right to the point here, 
that is the basis of a true value system. I was intrigued not long ago, listening to Jordan Peterson giving talks on the book of Genesis. And he came to the statement, Genesis 1, 26, and God said, let us make man in our own image. And it describes how God made men and women in his image and likeness. And he paused and he said, man, he said, that is the cornerstone of Western civilization. And he added, we neglected at our peril. In mm. fact, it's the source of all value. And yeah. there's a historian in Oxford called Tom Holland, who's oh, yes. become world famous in recent days, writing a book called Dominion, which mm -hmm. describes how he's moved from a position of thinking that we owed everything to the ancient Greeks to discovering that really behind Western civilization, the most important influence is the influence of scripture. And I find that book absolutely fascinating because oh. he's not seeing it through uh, pious um, eyes, uh, like a seminary student, so to speak, but he's yeah. seeing it through eyes that understand the history of the world. Mm -hmm. So here we have the beginnings of a foundation for life and without them, we yeah. are completely adrift. And yeah. it's interesting that Genesis begins uh, with the statement, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is, he created everything. And at the beginning of John's gospel, we get an explanation of that in a bit more detail. In the beginning was the word, and the word yes. was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through him. Now, I'm translating it correctly. Uh, often we read that, and many translations say, all things were made by him. And that, of course, is true. But the actual Greek word is, all things came to be through him. Now, why is ah. that important? Well, because in the beginning, the word already was. That is an existence statement. The God revealed in Genesis and in the Bible as a whole is eternal mm -hmm. he never began to exist yeah but the universe and you and i did begin to exist and we began to exist because god called us into existence now these are profound ideas <laughs> and one of the sad things to my mind is many christians are a bit scared of genesis because they've heard many arguments about some of the details but if we could get it into our heads just how important the fundamental doctrine that there is a creator is mm -hmm. now the details of how and when he did it are not unimportant but they're nowhere near as important as that he did it that's right you can yeah. tell that easily from the new testament it doesn't discuss when he did it or how he did it. It simply says that he did it. And yes. in fact, the name of my book, Seven Days That Divide the World, if you only had the New Testament, you'd never have heard of the seven days and they wouldn't be <laughs> dividing Christians as they do. So That's right. my book is really a plea for a sense of proportion. I regard all scripture as important. I believe mm -hmm. it to be the inspired word of God. Mm -hmm. But we need to realize that, and here I make a, a very fundamental observation. You will meet Christians who agree on all the basic doctrines of scripture. They agree on the fact of creation. They agree on the pre-existence of Christ. They agree on the details of his life, his miracles his atoning death, his resurrection, his mm. ascension, and his return. But they disagree on the interpretation of Genesis 1. Now that tells me, look, there seems to be a little bit of space for disagreement here. Yeah. And the tragedy is when the world outside mm -hmm. that doesn't care anything about the seven days of creation, whatever they might mean, sees Christians fighting about it as if it was an absolute deep 
matter mm -hmm. on which we could excommunicate one another and so on. I just well, leave yeah. for a sense of proportion. Let's ask ourselves, what does the world think of our uh, disagreements at this mm -hmm. level? And let's make sure that if we discuss it in the house, that's fine. But let's right. make sure we never put people off thinking yeah. that there was a creation. Get the facts first before yes. we go into the details. I love uh, the, your, your book, Seven Days That Divide the World, is uh, five chapters and then five appendices. Yes. And I love I love that in there uh, you have you have that that first section on the sort of the history of people's uh, attitude and view concerning the origin of all things, but then you do a you do a wonderful chapter on sort of the hermeneutics, the uh, interpretation of the biblical passage, which I really appreciate that you included that. You 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 also talk about yom, that Hebrew word, which was is is about the day, you know, one day or a day or, uh, and I you pointed out the definite article is missing in is it the first five of the days? Is that what I remember, is that right? Yes, it is indeed. The, the interesting yeah. thing is that some people insist that you see a word like day, yom in Hebrew, and it must always mean the same thing. And right, right. just read Genesis 1. And the first mention of it, and this actually amuses me slightly, <laughs> is God called the light day and the darkness he called night. The first right, right. use of the word is not 24 hours. It's right, 12 hours right. at the equator, you see. Yeah. And then, of course, there's a sequence, um, a day, a second day, and so on and so forth, with evenings and mornings that are normally taken by most scholars to be a 24-hour day. But then right. you get God rested. And... Uh, Interestingly enough, you don't have the formula, and there was evening and morning, a seventh day. And most scholars, and I mean evangelical, serious scholars, believe yep. that the seventh day actually has never ended. It is an indefinite okay. period of time during which God does no creating, but he mm -hmm. doesn't cease working for our redemption and all the rest of it. And no. then, of course, in chapter 2, verse 1, you have the statement that, that <clears throat> in the day they were created. Well, which day mm. is that? But then you realize that the word day, even in English, has yet another meaning. Mm. And I often used to say to people, you know, in my young day at Cambridge, well, what day was that? Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday? <laughs> the word day is used in most languages also. Yes as an indefinite period of time in the yes. past. So here in Genesis 1, we have arguably three or four different meanings for the word day. But then there's yeah. the final point that you mentioned first. And it's this, that Hebrew has a definite article, the, ha, hayom, the day. But it is no indefinite article. So. The sequence is not as in many translations. If you read them, they say the first day, the second, and so on. But that is not what it That's, says. Right, the right. definite article is missing on the first five of those days. So it's better to be thought of possibly as day one, day two, day right. three, or our first day, our second, but certainly not the. But then it changes. And it's the sixth and the seventh, which presumably puts emphasis on those two elements in the sequence, which makes a lot of sense because the sixth is the um, pinnacle of God's creation mm -hmm. of human beings. And the seventh is when he completes it all and he rests. So what I conclude looking at that is that this is a very sophisticated thing. And... Mm -hmm. No wonder people for thousands of years, not just hundreds of years or since mm -hmm. Charles Darwin or something like that, have had difficulty with these verses because they are so deep and sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And we should watch lest our dogmatism trips us up and oh, we start so saying things that cannot be substantiated. So that's the kind of thing mm -hmm. I uh, advance in my book, or at least it's the beginning of it. 
I think that's just brilliant. And I know uh, uh, around here in Nashville, anyway, sometimes I get uh, thought of as a as a fellow that kind of, uh, as, as we might say in the slang, geeks out on some of these kinds of things. But I think they make a huge difference. I, I love, uh, as you say, the way an ancient text like this uh, actually is showing such such great sophistication. I believe the word earth is also used in more than one way in that chapter. It is. And, um, and it's, it, it just reminds us that uh, uh, we must not say more than the text says, and, and, but yet we've got to say what the text says. And I'm with you. I think it, uh, it's not so much an explanation of the process as much as it's a declaration of the one who who, who began it all and, and, oh, and yes. declares this, right? That is so important to grasp that. Its sophistication is telling us about the richness of the language God has used to give us mm -hmm. this information. Yeah. And we must take it seriously. You see, the charge that's made at some people is they just listen to science and they don't take the Bible seriously. Well, of course, that's a mistake. I am very interested in science as a scientist, but mm -hmm. I take scripture uh, very seriously because it's the inspired word of God. And what I've discovered is that the more seriously you take scripture, the less difficulty you have in mm -hmm. teasing out an explanation that doesn't insult people's intelligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you see, if you ask yourself, what is clear about this text? Number one, that God is the creator. Number two, that he didn't create everything all at once. Whatever you believe about the days, there is a sequence. Right. Right. Number three, every member of that sequence begins with, and God said. Mm. Now, whatever time period is represented, that is the exact opposite of a mindless, unguided evolutionary process. This mm -hmm. is God speaking. It's as if Genesis 1 is unpacking John 1. All mm -hmm. things came to be through the word. Well, this is how they came to be. And God said, and God said. We could perhaps put it this way, that Genesis reveals the universe to be a series of speech acts not in the normal human sense, because I can speak and convey information, but mm -hmm. I cannot speak and something comes into existence, right. like yeah. universe or stars or planets and so on. That's yeah. what God uh, does. So the crucial thing is that God, uh, at a series of intervals, whatever they may be, and that can be discussed, inputs information and power into an ongoing situation but then that creation act stops once he has created men and women in his image and you know what i like the best about that sequence it's the thing nobody ever notices as far as i can see oh, a... there's another and god said but it's and god said to them this is oh, the yeah. first time god speaks <laughs> and it's showing us what it means to be made in the image of God, that we can hear God's word, mm -hmm. we can speak to God, we can listen to him. And therefore, it's indicating to us the deepest significance is to be had in human life in, if you like, linguistic fellowship and communication with the yeah. God that created us. Now, this is big stuff. And I feel yeah. that if we emphasize that, the little details which are not unimportant get into a correct proportion and we've got something wonderful to say to people that they yeah. can see makes sense yeah i love that uh i know that you've read a bit of c john collins as well uh oh yes uh, i find jack collins very helpful and indeed encouraging his I'm, stuff uh, is very well worth reading well, I've got uh, his book, uh, Reading Genesis, well, and he's a professor at the seminary that I, I uh, graduated from some years ago. But I've enjoyed uh, reading your book alongside of his as well. And he talks about uh, uh, a person that I know has had a, a great uh, impact on your own life, C.S. Lewis. He talks about this sort of critically intuitive approach to uh, 
to understanding or interpreting Genesis, the uh, you mentioned linguistics, and I think that's linguistics, rhetoric, and uh, uh, perhaps literary style. I think that 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 Jack Collins talks about your your uh, your own experience. I know with C.S. Lewis, you you uh, I, and I, I a lot of our folk that come to our church are familiar with him. But I mean, you you actually heard the man speak, didn't you? I did that. That what day, was that like? They, I, I'm old, Pastor Jim. I'm old. <laughs> and, uh, in 1962, when I came to Cambridge, Lewis, I knew was there. I didn't know he was very ill, but I had already oh. absorbed a huge amount of his writing. I'd read almost everything except the very mm. technical articles on medieval English and so mm. on. But I, I later read both of those as well. But uh, the maths lecture theater was just across the road from where he was lecturing on English. Mm. So I looked it up and uh, Julie went and listened to what turned out to be the very last lectures he ever gave in the university oh. on the poetry of John Dunn, the so-called uh, oh, yeah. mystical poet. Mm -hmm. And it was, <laughs> the experience was quite remarkable. And actually, I tried to reproduce it in the recent film I've made with Kevin Sorbo of Hollywood fame and drama and Hercules and so on. That yeah. Lewis, it was very cold winter and he was dressed in a very heavy coat and a hat and a big thick scarf. And he'd start to lecture the moment he came into the room, bursting through double doors. And he started <laughs> lecturing while he picked his way among the students who were all over the floor and sitting on the windowsills and all the wow. rest of it. And as he <laughs> lectured and moved towards the podium, he was slowly divesting himself of his outer garments, unwinding his scarf, <laughs> taking off his hat and coat. And by the time he got to the podium, he'd given us five minutes of a brilliantly constructed lecture. Mm. And he went through for the next 50 minutes. And then, and that was the very amusing thing, he reversed the process. So still oh. lecturing, he put on his hat, wound up his scarf, put on his coat, and his last words were delivered as he plunged out into the cold through the double doors. <laughs> there was no Q and A. Oh, wow! What a treat! It How was amazing. Treat. It was a treat, and yeah. of course, his method of thinking—he wasn't a scientist, mm -hmm. and that for me was important. He understood the philosophy of science, though. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very fortunate in terms of education that I, my public education was mainly in mathematics and philosophy of science. But mm -hmm. I had a mentor who was very much a C.S. Lewis figure, in the humanities, a professor of Latin and Greek. And he trained me in the ancient humanities, just as Lewis had been trained. So I was able to benefit enormously from Lewis's stuff. Well, you've also, as I recall, in some of the material I've read on you and on your, your, your website as well, uh, you've got some um, background with a fellow named John Polkinghorne as well. So what, I, what I'm just completely fascinated when I, when I listen to you speak or read your books is that all of these different uh, uh, disciplines uh, converge, they all come together. And it, it helps, uh, I think, to round out what you've mentioned before, our, your worldview. And you're not, in other words, you're not, uh, you're not merely uh, from just one, looking at this from one discipline. And I appreciate that so much, John. And it, it helps because you can, you can uh, you can tell a story that uh, causes you to chuckle and then causes me to chuckle about C.S. Lewis divesting himself of his clothes. And then at the same time, he's talking about literature. And then there's John Polkinghorne talking about quantum physics. That's and these correct. Are both and men of faith. Yeah. John actually taught the course on quantum mechanics that I attended. Uh, but I benefited from him mainly not in quantum mechanics, although I've been revisiting that whole topic um, mm -hmm. recently. Um, <clears throat> I benefited from him in his many writings on science and religion because he 
thinks extremely clearly and communicated to me a number of ideas that I've quoted in a number of my books. And, you know, it's very important for someone in my position to interact with leading figures mm -hmm. who are quality scientists at the, at, the, at the very top order and are Christian believers. And I think that's equipped you well. I've seen your, uh, you've, de you've also debated some of these uh, so-called new atheists, uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, Chris, the late Christopher Hitchens, and some others uh, as well, as I recall. And it's that kind of interface that has equipped you so well to be able to dialogue uh, with some of those folks, right? Well, it's kind of you to say so. I tend to let other people judge, but certainly <laughs> I got to the stage where I've spent my life being interested in why people believe what they believe. Mm. And I've made a particular study of the polar opposite of my Christian convictions, and that is atheism. Wow. And spent quite a bit of time during the Cold War behind the Iron Curtain, and then after that wow. in Russia and Ukraine, and discussing these things with people. And that was a very good preparation for taking on the likes of Richard Dawkins and mm. Hitchens and Singer and a number of others. Yeah. And I, I felt, I mean, I didn't ask to be catapulted as I was into the public scene, but I felt that it's very important that some Christians stand up in the public sphere because otherwise the atheists who get far more media exposure than we ever do, mm -hmm. there's no level playing field, they appear to have the leading arguments and I don't believe mm -hmm. that at all. Mm -hmm. So I want to get into that sphere and I was very fortunate to be able to do some very high level debates that are still being watched today oh, and yes. have been seen by hundreds of thousands if not millions of people and i'd encourage our our viewers today to uh to if they if they if they would be interested in such things to uh see some of your lectures and some of your talks that you've given at uh, trinity forum and and some of the other sure. Veritas forums and that sort of thing. To I'd encourage them to to look at some of those. John, I've I've collected three of my very favorite John Lennox quotes from a couple of your books and a couple of your talks. And I'm I'm just wondering if I were to read them and we were to post them on the screen, would you maybe perhaps uh, give us a little context or per, if you want to amplify a little bit of each one of them? But uh, I love this one. Uh, either human intelligence ultimately owes its origin to mindless matter or there is a creator. It is strange that some people claim that it is their intelligence that leads them to prefer the first to the second. That's brilliant. Well, it, I think it's the final sentence in my book, God's Undertaker, which was the first major book that I, I wrote uh, on this topic. The background to it is, is very simply this, that if you believe that your mind is simply the end product of mindless, unguided processes, mm -hmm. I think this ends up in absurdity. Uh, let me illustrate it by what I sometimes do when I get discussing these things with leading scientists. I ask them what they do their science with, and uh, they realize I'm talking about, you know, <laughs> and uh, they say, I do my science with my, and they're about to say mind when they remember it's not politically correct to believe in the mind. So they say right. with my brain. Right. And I say, okay, I actually believe the brain and the mind are both real, but they're distinct. But I'll, I'll stay with you for the minute. So you do science with your brain. Tell me about your brain. What's a brief history of the brain? Well, that's easy. It's the end product of a mindless physical processes, unguided. <laughs> oh, yes. And you trust it. Let me ask you an honest question. I want a straight answer to it. If you knew that the computer you use every day was the product of unguided 
natural forces, would you trust it? Mm. The interesting thing is I've always got the explicit answer no to that. So Mm. I now smile and say, you have a problem. You see, (laughs) what I am contending, and I'm not the only one, C.S. Lewis saw this long ago, Alvin Plantinga saw it and wrote Mm -hmm. very convincingly about it. But uh, perhaps the the most important of all is is Thomas Nagel, the atheist philosopher Mm -hmm. who sees the point. That if you set up a theory, here's how C.S. Lewis put it, any theory that invalidates the workings of the mind cannot be true because you've used thinking to reach it. Mm -hmm. And my chief objection to atheism is not that I'm a Christian, it's that I'm a scientist. Mm -hmm. And atheism taken to a logical conclusion undermines faith in the very rationality you need not only to do science, but anything else. So Mm -hmm. that's the story behind that. That's a great quote. Um, this one as well, um, it is from uh, Gunning for God, uh, your book called Gunning for God, which I also have read. He says, uh, you said, it is rather ironical that in the 16th century, some people resisted advance in science because it seemed to threaten belief in God, whereas in the 20th century, scientific models of a beginning were resisted because they might increase the plausibility of belief in God. That's correct. Really? That's correct. And I remember that happening in the 1960s when Mm. for centuries people had gone with Aristotle believing Mm. in an eternal universe. And then suddenly there came these evidences that the universe appeared to be expanding and uh, things like that introduced, by the way, by a Catholic priest, Georges Lemaitre. And eventually it came to Penzias' uh, discovery for which he and someone else got the Nobel Prize of the so-called yes. microwave background. That's right. And the evidence that there was a beginning to space-time became overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And the reaction in the United Kingdom at the very top level of science, in the words of the editor of the most important scientific journal in the world, Nature, a man called Maddox, mm-hmm. who said something like this, that we mustn't give in to this idea of a beginning because it will give too much leverage to people who believe the Bible. So (laughs) it's quite remarkable, actually. And it's an important thing that we know this. Yes. That that this is the fact that at that level, I talk about a convergence between Genesis and contemporary science, because I'm Mm. well aware as a scientist that scientists change their minds. So I don't want to over dogmatize, but there's a consensus at the moment, which Christians ought to welcome. Mm. Uh, Sometimes, you see, I meet people that say, oh, we don't like the words Big Bang, no Christians should believe in the Big Bang. But just a moment, the words Big Bang, that's just a label on a mystery. It's simply acknowledging there was a beginning. Well, we acknowledge that, except we add to it the fact that the beginning had a cause, and the cause Mm -hmm. was an eternal creator, God. So no Christian should be afraid of the label Big Bang. It was actually coined by Sir Fred Hoyle, who was one of my examiners at Cambridge. And he didn't like it at all. (laughs) You and your Big Bang. He didn't seem to. (laughs) Welcome that because he believed in the steady state universe. So mm. so we need to be very careful to understand exactly what it is people are saying. The yeah. Bible has more to tell us in that sense about the ultimate cause. Science is yes. no ultimate cause. Well, that's, that's great too. The uh, third quote I wanted to put up was uh, when I heard you say, and uh, you said it is utterly clear in scripture that God does not expect us to believe without evidence. It is not blind faith. And uh, great summary, just uh, I, I think great assurance, reassurance too for, for believers. Not only would that be persuasive, uh, perhaps as you're sharing your faith with someone who is, who's objecting because they say it's just blind faith, but I think for believers, it's it, when we when we listen to your talks or uh, when we when we listen to Sam Albury or we or we listen to a Rebecca McLaughlin, whatever, we've got these these folks that have studied at a level most of us don't have an opportunity to, 
and they're just uh, uh, giving us uh, Alvin Plantinga as well, like you, you just mentioned him, or Francis Collins. We, we're we're being given uh, great resources, I think, to uh, help uh, reassure us that, that what our minds and what our senses are perceiving, there's a correspondence th that between what we see and experience and what the Bible is claiming is true. That's absolutely right. And it's probably a, a very good point to, to bring our fascinating conversation to its climax, because this is such an important question. Mm. It's important because the concept of faith has been redefined by people like Richard Dawkins and Christopher mm. Hitchens. Mm -hmm. And they actually talk nonsense. They say that faith is believing where there's no evidence or where we know that it isn't true. Now that's blind faith. Mm. And to say that the Bible encourages blind faith is almost blasphemous. And we need to investigate this. Because mm -hmm. faith, the English word, comes from the Latin fides, from which we get mm -hmm. fidelity, where it concentrates yes. on, emphasizes reliability, trustworthiness, and all the rest of it. Faith, mm -hmm. belief are the, exactly the same concept. Now, evidence-based faith is something we all understand. Some people once thought they could trust they could have faith in bankers. And they discovered that the bankers let them down and we had a financial crisis. And if you remember, as many of our viewers will, the markets froze until the evidence came back that the banks could be trusted. And slowly but surely it built up again. Now this is hugely important. Everybody mm -hmm. understands the need for evidence. If you go in to borrow money to buy a house and you say to the, the banker, look, I want to borrow $100,000. Uh, yes, uh, well, we may lend it to you. Uh, what evidence are you going to show us that you're trustworthy? Oh, just trust me. It'll be fine. Trust me. <laughs> That'll never get you anywhere. They no. want to know the collateral, the value of the real estate you mm -hmm. have and, and all the rest of it. We all know what evidence-based trust is. Not only that, but in connection with facts, what's happening and trusting people, we base it on evidence or else we're fools. We live in a day where a lot of people are talking about mm -hmm. fake news. And mm -hmm. fake news is information that is passed out where there's no substantiating evidence. Now, the key thing in all of this is very simple. What is it that Jesus expects us to do? On what basis does he expect us to trust him? The mm -hmm. Gospel of John explains this perfectly. In chapter 20, it says this. John writes, Jesus did many other signs mm -hmm. that are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe, that you might have faith mm -hmm. that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, mm -hmm. the Son of God, and that through believing you might have life in his name. Now, mm -hmm. that is so important. These things are written in order that you might believe. In other words, I have selected a group of signs like Jesus turning water into wine, like his feeding the 5,000, like his raising Lazarus, like his own resurrection. John is bringing those as evidence upon which faith can be based. Mm -hmm. This is the exact opposite of blind faith. Mm -hmm. Jesus will never expect anyone to believe something for which there's no evidence. Mm -hmm. And that is so massively important. That's now, so there is a caveat, and that is this. As we mature as Christians, God will lead, our, lead us deeper and deeper into an experience of what it means to trust him. And sometimes we'd be asked to trust where the way forward is not completely clear, and we don't have all the evidence mm -hmm. that we'd need to have. But then we do have evidence. 
we have the evidence of all the past experiences of mm -hmm. trusting God and it being proved true. That's so true. in every case, Christianity is characterized being an evidence-based faith mm -hmm. or belief system. That wow. is, we're believing where there is evidence, not in the absence of evidence. Mm -hmm. If we did that, we would be fools. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate your asking that question because there's a battle going on in the world today for the very meaning of faith. Mm -hmm. And so many of our contemporaries and younger people, if you ask them, what is faith? They'll say faith is a religious word that means believing where there's no evidence. Mm -hmm. Faith is an ordinary word. And it doesn't mean believing where there's no evidence. It's not, uh, it's only valuable if there is evidence and it's only reliable to the extent that there's evidence behind it. Wow. So that's a hugely important thing. Oh, that's so good. Thank you, John. And uh, you mentioned the movie earlier. I just wanted to get you to give me a, a couple of sentences on the, on the movie. I believe it's called Against the Tide. And what was, what was the, the purpose of the movie and, and where can people find it um, well, if they want to the, see that? The movie was a very interesting thing to do, although film is not my genre. But the basic idea against the tide is, in one sense, a record of my standing up in the public space to debate with Dawkins and Hitchens mm -hmm. and so on. And there are many okay. excerpts in the film of doing that in all kinds of situations. But it's in two parts and kevin sorbo who acted the atheist professor in god's not dead mm -hmm. uh, the genesis of it is very simple people who know that film uh, they'll probably not remember but the young student who confronted the atheist professor used arguments from my books to do so uh -huh. and that's explicitly so my name is mentioned in the film mm -hmm. and the idea is that Kevin Sorbo now, having finished that film and as an actor in his own right and as a person who is himself a believer and very interested in these things, That's wonders great. how a mathematician at Oxford that presumably has a career um, quite independent of his Christian commitment, why he dares to come out of his comfort zone and challenge people like Dawkins. So he comes to Oxford to find out. And the first part of the film is where he and I go around various situations in Oxford mm -hmm. discussing the big questions that are mainly raised from the perspective of science and, and logic about the wow. Christian faith. Wow. And then he comes to a point where he says, but look, it's all very well talking about science and evidence for God in the universe, but you're a Christian. How do you make that step to the specificity of Christianity? Yeah. And I say to him, look, the best way to do that is for us both to go where it all started. Why don't I invite you to dinner in Galilee? Wow. So if we go to Israel, and the second <laughs> part of the film investigates specifically Christian um, belief in mm -hmm. light of the evidence and it's all about evidence mm -hmm. in the the holy land now the film was presented particularly in the us for re limited release and was shown in a number of cinemas but of course the lockdown made it very difficult but yeah. i understand it would be out very soon on dvd and blu-ray okay. and things like that oh good so it good be readily available and excellent if you want to know about it it's it's uh, produced by pens more films and it's a okay. caris production and if you look at my website johnlennox.org you will find out about it. Okay, and good. I hope that many people will enjoy it. I've also written a book to accompany it because this film is designed to stimulate thought and it will not answer as many questions as it asks. So I've written a book to go deeper in to every section of it to fill it out for those people who want to follow it a bit further. So. That's there will great. be a book coming out very soon to accompany it. 
Well, well, John, thank you for that. And we'll post uh, some of this information on a slide uh, right as, uh, as this particular broadcast ends so that people can write that down. And then we'll also include a link to this uh, discussion uh, on our website here, thevillagechapel.com. But thank you so much for being with us on this uh, edition of Friday Night Chats here at the Village Chapel. And, and uh, we'll also include it on our YouTube channel for the church and, and folks can go there and uh, as, they, as they did with the other Friday Night Chats we've done. But um, I'm, I'm so grateful to you. I, I uh, appreciate your, uh, the way the Lord has used you to encourage believers as well as to persuade uh, and, and I, I love the way that uh, for, for folks like yourself, uh, persuasion doesn't have to be about being abrasive or anything like that. You're, you're so uh, congenial and, and friendly. And yet uh, I just, uh, I, the, the whimsical approach to me is much, much better. And I, I just so appreciate that about you, John. So thank Not you for being all. with us. And thank you very much indeed for inviting me on. And God bless you and your work in the church. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much, John. Bye.